All right, so today we're going to get into extrema. In other words, maximums and minimums. And you should have seen all that stuff in pre-cal last year. This is really just going to be a much faster way to end up identifying where the maximums are that, that you're not going to uh, be totally dependent on a calculator to do. All right, so let's, let's get into these notes. Again, if you want to like read them, you can pause the video, you can read them. Video quality is probably pretty terrible since the technology we have is just not the best. Oh well. Uh, you can always just download the PDFs from my website or from Schoology and you can read it there. But I'm not going to read it to you. Basically, we're going to tr try to figure out when is a function increasing, going up, when is a function decreasing, going down, when is it constant, aka has a slope of zero. And then based on that information, can we figure out where this function has relative extrema, where it has maximums, where it has minimums. Okay, and that process is actually called the first derivative test. Uh, nothing on the first page is hugely important. On the second page, again, it's just like, oh, look, here's some graphs. Sometimes it's going up, sometimes it's going down, sometimes it's zero. Um, and, and we know, hey, like, if the slope is positive, that means the graph is increasing. If the slope is negative, that means the graph is decreasing. And if the slope uh, is zero, that means, hey, it's going to be constant uh, just at that one point. So we know that first derivative is going to tell us the slope, which in turn is going to tell us whether it's increasing, decreasing, or constant. And then we're going to use that information to classify extrema. Okay, so let's look at this. This is important and conceptual. Hopefully it makes sense. It's basically just putting the D word derivative on the stuff that you would have learned last year in pre-cal. Let's read it. If f prime is greater than zero, so if your derivative is positive, then f is increasing on that interval. That seems like it should make sense. The derivative tells you the slope of the graph. And so if the slope is positive, the function is going up. So yes, it should be increasing. And then correspondingly, if the derivative, aka the slope, is negative, then the graph should be going downwards. And we say that the function f is decreasing. If the derivative is zero, then it's neither increasing nor decreasing. It's typically just constant. And we don't usually have intervals where it's constant. Typically, it's just going to be constant at specific points. So let's look at this first example, 6.1, and let's identify the intervals where f is increasing, decreasing, and constant. Again, we're just going to assume this is your graph of f of x. Okay, so here we go. F is increasing. Sometimes I'll just like to put the little up arrow because I'm lazy. Uh, F is going to be increasing when your derivative is positive. You don't really need to, to know a whole lot about that, but just, just look at this graph. Right? You could hopefully be able to tell me where this graph is increasing. Looks like it's going to be increasing on this interval and then also on this interval. So you need to know where those mins and maxes are. We'll say, hey, this maximum is at negative three. We'll say this minimum is at negative one. And we'll say that max is at two. So from negative infinity all the way to this point at negative three, the graph is going to be increasing. And uh, we'll say from negative one to two. Okay, so that should hopefully be pretty easy. Going, oops, I'm totally off the screen. That's my bad. There you go. I fixed it, kind of, sort of, a little bit late. And then let's do decreasing. So F would be decreasing, which sometimes I'm just going to denote with a little down arrow. When you're, oops, I don't know why I'm writing that as an exponent. When your derivative is negative. So let's go look at when this slope it's negative. It's going to be from the maximum to the minimum. So from negative three to negative one. And then also everywhere to the right of this max, right? From this point, the graph is just going to go down and down and down. Uh, so from that point, which is at x equals two, and then onwards. So increasing and decreasing, going up, going down. Should be pretty simple. And then also where it's constant. Uh, so f is going to be constant. If you want, you could put a little horizontal line. That's only going to be true when the derivative is equal to zero, so where you'd have horizontal tangents. So just right at this point, right at this point, 
and then right at this point. You don't have intervals where the graph is flat. You only have these little instantaneous points. So we'll say, therefore, at x equals negative 3, negative 1, and 2. So increasing means going up, which means the derivative is positive. Decreasing means going down, which means the derivative is negative. Constant means it's not going anywhere. It's constant. Uh, so when the derivative is equal to 0, and that's usually only going to happen at specific points. And now if you notice, all of those, the two maximums and the minimums, those are what we're going to collect and we're going to call extrema, right? So extrema, that's just a word that stands for all of the minimums and maximums uh, put together, right? All of them collected into one nice uh, group, extrema. That just means maximums and minimums. And then relative versus local those two words mean the same thing. That just means, hey, there's a little interval. So that way, on the left side of that interval, or on that point, and also on the right side, right? There's some little interval. There's some little kind of uh, piece of the graph where that specific point is the lowest y value in that specific uh, part of the graph, right? Uh, same thing for your relative or your local max. Like, hey, this, you could check a little bit to the left, and you could check a little bit to the right, but there's some type of a snapshot, some type of a window, some type of an interval, so that the specific point I'm looking at has the biggest y value in that interval, or in that snapshot, or in that little piece. Right, so relative or local just means, hey, there's some little interval uh, around that point to the left and to the right, but there's some little interval so that the specific point I'm looking at is either bigger than all of the points immediately around it uh, or smaller than all the points immediately around it. Global or absolute means, hey, it's the biggest function the or it's the biggest value the function ever hits ever or it's the smallest uh, that the function ever hits. We really care more about relative or local uh, the absolute and the global, like that's nice, but we don't we don't do them as much. But today, I think we're probably just going to be focused on the the relative, i.e., the local extrema. Okay, great. So uh, again, you can pause, you could read. I'm not going to read it to you because that's just going to make these videos extra long. Uh, so if you want, take a time out. You can pause, you can read. But I'm going to go ahead and go. We should hopefully know what a relative minimum and a relative maximum look like because that's straight up pre-cal. Okay, now here's a new definition for us, something called a critical value or, or a stationary point. Uh, you could also hear them called uh, critical points. Uh, and these are going to be, right, if you're thinking about critical values or stationary points or critical points, all those are just different ways of saying the exact same thing. And these critical points, uh, they're the collection of all of the locations that could potentially be a relative max or a relative minimum, right? Not every single critical point is a max or a min, uh, but it's the collection of all of the points that might be maxes or minimums. So we're gonna collect all of them by defining them as such. The derivative is either zero or the derivative is undefined. And the undefined derivative typically only happens when you have sharp turns that come up uh, like this, or sometimes when, it, when you see a sharp turn like on an absolute value graph. Uh, those are actually undefined derivatives, uh, but they're still minimums or maximums if it happened to be reflected. Okay, so your critical points, it's the collection of all of the spots, all of the x values where the derivative is either zero or undefined. And of course, we're going to want it to be in the domain. Like, hey, if, you, if you've got a vertical asymptote, yes, the derivative is undefined, but literally the function is undefined. So it wouldn't be a maximum or a minimum because there is, there is no point. So of course, that second condition, that point has to exist. That seems fairly easy. All right, part two, or example six to you. Let's locate uh, and identify the critical values. Well, you'd have one of them here uh, where you have the horizontal tangent. Looks like the derivative at negative 3 is equal to 0. So that would for sure be a uh, critical point. And then right here, you have another issue. The derivative at negative 1 is undefined because of that sharp turn. If there's no smooth turn, if there's a sharp turn, or if there's something called a cusp, which that's actually a cusp, uh, then the derivative is undefined. Okay, so if we're just going to look and try to identify uh, where the critical points are, you're basically just looking for the turning points or anywhere the, the, the graph has a slope of zero 
or the, the slope is undefined. So here we go, x equals negative 3, because the derivative at negative 3 is 0. There I go, being off the screen again, my bad. And then also, x equals negative 1, because the derivative at negative 1 is undefined. And again, it's undefined because that little cusp. Uh, another thing, like if you had uh, an absolute value graph, that sharp turn uh, would also be a problem, right? The derivative does not exist if it's not a smooth turning point. So if it's something very abrupt, like a cusp or like a sharp turn, the derivative is undefined. Those points could still be mins and maxes, uh, but, but the derivative would be undefined. Here's an example. If you had a function... Uh, if you had a function, oops, I'm off the screen, there I go again. If you had a function that's kind of like this, like a cubic function, there may be a point here in the middle where the slope is zero, but if it's increasing on the left and increasing on the right, well, that point would be neither a max nor a minimum. What's important in order for a critical point to end up being a max or a min, what's important is that the behavior or the slope has to change. Like if it changes from going up to going up, right, well really it doesn't change, if the function is increasing on both sides, well that's not going to be a max, nor is it going to be a minimum. Or if you had a function that looked like this, like yeah, there very well may be a spot where the derivative is zero, uh, so this would be a critical point, and this would be a critical point, but those are some examples of critical points that don't end up being important. They don't end up being a maximum or they don't end up being a minimum. What we care about more are the critical points that do end up being maximums or do end up being minimums. And we can find those uh, through this process called the first derivative test, which I believe we're going to get into uh, uh, in just a minute. All right, so part uh, 6.3, let's find the critical points for this function again. So we're going to take that derivative, figure out where the derivative is 0 or where the derivative is undefined. That's your critical points. Again, stationary points, critical values, critical points, those are all uh, just synonyms for the same thing. I am struggling today to keep this on the screen. My bad. All right, so first thing, though, take the derivative. Looks like 3x squared minus 4x plus 1. Okay, so that one's not too bad. That derivative is never going to be undefined, so you're not going to have any cusps or you're not going to have any uh, sharp turns. We're only going to have to worry about when this derivative is 0. So you would try to factor it, and I think this one is going to factor 3x minus 1 uh, and then x minus 1, always check to see if you factored it correctly by just multiplying it back together. Let's see, that looks right. Minus 3, minus 1, yep. So that does look like the correct factorization. Then you could set each chunk equal to 0, and then you can find uh, your two critical points. And again, your reasoning would be because your derivative is equal to 0. So you just take your derivative, set it equal to 0, and solve. That's pretty easy. Okay, next one. Find the vertex of this parabola. Now, what do you know about a vertex? Well, a vertex is the turning point. It's the spot uh, where you have a horizontal tangent, a.k.a. it's the spot where your derivative is equal to zero. There I go, being off the screen. You know what? I'm just going to zoom it out, and then if you can't read, that's okay. At least you should be able to see my work. Uh, so your, your turning points, your vertex, it's where your slope is going to be zero. So once again, you just got to take the derivative, set it equal to zero. Here we go for this example. I'm on the screen. I should probably check more frequently. 2x minus 8. There's your derivative function. Set it equal to 0 because we want to find where we have horizontal tangents. Uh, so it looks like x equals 4 is going to be our location. Now it doesn't just say find the x value, right? It says find the vertex, which implies the whole coordinate point. So I have the x value. All I would have to do now is plug in that x value into your original function. If you do, let's see, 16 uh, minus 32 plus 14. Uh, so it looks like that y value is going to end up being negative 2. So there's your vertex. It's the point for negative 2. Actually, that sketch, look at that. I was kind of lucky. That looked like that sketch actually ended up being fairly accurate. Uh, so your vertex, your turning point, that's going to be the spot where the graph has a horizontal tangent, where the slope of the graph at that one point is 0. 
Uh, so to find it, you don't have to complete the square. You don't have to do all that nice stuff. You don't have to do your negative b over 2a. You can if you want. It should still give you the same answer. Uh, but as far as calculus-wise, finding the vertex of a quadratic should be pretty easy. Take the derivative, set it equal to 0. Okay, here we go, 6.5. Find the stationary points, classify them as either a max or a minimum. Okay, so this one's cubic, so we know we could potentially have uh, two extrema, right? Your, your maximums and minimums, there's always one less uh, than the degree. So if it's a degree three, you should have two turning points. We should know that from pre-cal. Uh, so let's, let's go find them. Take the derivative, set it equal to zero. That's your go-to fallback strategy for really uh, a whole lot of things in calculus. If, you, if you're working on a question and you have no idea what to do, just take the derivative, set it equal to zero. You'll probably get some partial credit. 6x squared plus 6x minus 12. There's your derivative. Let's see, we would set this equal to zero. You can factor out a 6. Then you could factor, I think that one's smelling like a plus 2, minus 1. Check it, let's see, x squared, minus 1, plus 2, yep, so that looks good. And then we have these two points, x equals negative 2, and then x equals 1, right? So those look uh, like we're going to end up having uh, some special values at those points. Uh, let's let's kind of think about what the shape would be. You know it's cubic and it's going to be positive, so this graph is going to look more or less something like this, right? You should know that just from your general math skills. It's cubic, leading coefficient is positive, so it's going to go up on the right. It's an odd degree, so it's going to go down on the left. Uh, so now let's go ahead and check. Let's plug in these two, figure out what the y-coordinates are, and try to confirm, kind of just algebraically, if they're either maximums or minimums. So plug in your negative 2 into the original function, and then if you plug in 1 into the original function, uh, let's see, if you plug in, I've already done these values, if you plug in negative 2, you should get out 16, then if you plug in uh, the positive 1, you should get out a negative 11. So it looks like we just got this point as negative 2, 16, and then this point uh, was 1, negative 11. That makes sense, we kind of thought the one on the left should be the max, and we kind of thought the one on the right uh, should be the minimum, just based on what we kind of were anticipating this sketch to end up looking like. Uh, so here we go, we found the critical points, you can plug them in, that's the bigger value, so for sure that's the maximum, this is the smaller value, so that has to be the minimum. You can think about the graph, that should also kind of confirm, uh, but here we have negative 2, 16, there's your relative max, and then you had your 1, negative 11, uh, which was your relative minimum. Okay, so that one's not too bad, but you're not going to have to do stuff like that again. We're going to actually be doing something slightly different, uh, and it's it's called a sign chart, right? And so we're going to use a sign chart. We're going to do something called the first derivative test. Uh, that, that ends up doing all this, I think, in a much better, more organized fashion. So let's flip it over. We're going to keep working with the same example, uh, but we're going to kind of break it down, and we're going to do some sign charts for it. Okay, here we go. Again, I'm not going to read the paragraph. You read the paragraph. Uh, but basically, we're going to do a sign chart for that previous function. And we're going to test the derivative to see whether the derivative is positive or negative, right? We already found the critical points, right? We have the same, let me just copy, the derivative, uh, we got it was uh, 3x minus 1, and then x minus 1. You don't really care about the 6 out in front, that doesn't, that doesn't really affect anything. So we had the critical points was a 1 third. Ooh, this is, I think, this is actually a different one, my bad. I thought this was the same example, uh, so I guess we should... This may be going back to one that was like two examples ago. Anyways, let's let's just go take this derivative again and then refactor re it. So that'd be a 3x squared minus 4x plus 1. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, which will factor your 3x minus 1 and then your x minus 1. All right, this was, I think, the very first example, so that's good. So we had the x equals 1 third and the x equals 1. So there's the critical points. Very good. Uh, now what we would want to do is 
do uh, this thing called a sign chart. So it's to test the positivity with your first derivative. So we have these two critical points. We know at both of those points, uh, the, the value of that derivative uh, is zero. That's great. Those are your turning points. So yeah, of course the derivative is going to give you zero. But what we want to do is test a point on, on, on kind of either side of these special values, right? So for instance, let's test this first interval. Let's check to the right side of one. Uh, so let's see, like, how about x equals 2? That's a number to the right side of 1. That seems, that seems like it's going to work pretty well. Uh, let's plug in 2. And you can either plug it in to the non-factored version or to the factored version. I like to plug it into the factored version because it's faster. Right, so let's, let's test 2. If I plug in 2 for x, 6 times 2 minus 1, that'd be 5. You don't really care that it's 5. All you care is that it's positive. So if I were to plug in 2, that chunk would be positive. And then 2 minus 1, that chunk is also positive. So I know overall that chunk, if I plug in 2, that chunk is going to end up giving you out a positive value. And if the derivative is positive, what does that tell you about your original function? Well, it tells you that that function would be increasing, going up. So we checked the sign of the first derivative, right? We took a, a test value, something to the right side of 1. We plugged it in. We figured out, hey, that derivative is positive. The derivative positive means increasing. Okay, wonderful. Let's do the other two intervals. Uh, a good test value between these two points could be something like 1 half. So let's plug in 1 half. Okay. Oh, I guess I was supposed to kind of be doing the work down here. So how about this? Uh, we had x equals 2, then we'll do x equals 1 half, and we could do x equals 0. So your test point uh, times 2, uh, minus 1, and then your 2 minus 1. Uh, that was your plus plus, so overall it was positive. Okay, so I did have a spot. I don't usually always do the sign charts this kind of in-depth of a breakdown. I'll show you how I like to do them in the next page on the ne on the example 6.6. Six. This one's kind of extra with how far they break it down. But it's okay. We'll live. Uh, let's test 1 half. So I've got 3 times 1 half minus 1, and then I've got uh, 1 half minus 1. Let's see. That'd be 1.5 minus 1, so I know that first chunk would still be positive. But 1 half minus 1 and that would be a negative number. So if this chunk is positive, but this chunk is negative, then overall, you know that derivative would give you a negative output. And if the, the function has a negative slope, we say that it is decreasing. Okay, one more interval. Let's test x equals 0 for this interval to the left of 1 third. So I'd have 3 times 0 minus 1, and then 0 minus 1. Okay, 3 times 0 minus 1, that would give you a negative number. 0 minus 1, that's also negative. But if this chunk is negative and that chunk is negative, and if you have two negative numbers and they are multiplied by each other, that result would actually be positive. Right, so again, we're just testing uh, those, those, those sub-intervals to see whether the derivative yields a positive result or a negative result. And then the positive tells me the original function is going to be increasing. Now look at this original function, and let's try to classify the one, ha uh, the one third and the one. Let's try to classify them as maximums or minimums. Look at the behavior. So this function is increasing, right? It's going up, and then it starts to decrease and then it increases again. So if your graph changes from going up to going down, well, that's going to have to be a maximum, right? Or if your graph changes from going down to going up, that's going to have to be a minimum. So without ever having to plug in to the original function, without having to look at the y values, just based on the shape and based on whether this graph is going up or going down and how it specifically changes, we are able to classify things as a max or a min. All right, so let me actually kind of break out this first derivative test into a way that I think is a little bit uh, simpler. So here we go, first derivative test. And this is used to classify extrema, right? Let's see, if your derivative changes from positive to negative, then your original function changes from increasing to decreasing. 
And if your function changes from going up to going down, you say, therefore, f has a relative maximum. At that specific point, right, at the x value where the derivative changes from positive to negative, that means your original function changes from positive slope to negative slope. So your function changes from increasing to decreasing. So right at that instant, you're going to have a relative maximum. Okay, now let's look at the other side. If your derivative changes from negative to positive, so this is the reverse case. Well, if your derivative changes from negative to positive, then your original function starts off with a negative slope, so it starts off as decreasing, and then it's going to change to a positive slope. And if you change from decreasing, going down, to increasing, going up, we could logically conclude then, therefore, f has, I don't know why I started to do that like an f, therefore, f has a relative minimum, right? So it's important that it changes. If you think back uh, to the example I was kind of talking about a little while ago, if the slope is negative on both sides, or if the slope is positive on both sides, if there's no change in the slope, or if there's no change in the behavior, behavior is just a synonym for slope, right? It's just a fancy word that we use in calculus. If there's no change, then there's not going to be a max or a minimum at that point. It's still a critical point if the derivative is zero, but not all critical points end up being maximums or minimums. Some of them end up being something else later on that we'll figure out, uh, I think probably at, towards the end of this packet or maybe in the next one, uh, but if, if the slope doesn't change, then it's not going to be a max nor a minimum. I hope that makes sense. Anyways, first derivative uh, test, I would pause it. I would write this down uh, because it's, it's important. But let's get back into the notes, and then let's do the rest of these sign chart questions. And we're not going to spend as much time doing them. We're going to go faster. We're not going to kind of separate it out. We're going to do, do it just all at once, which is, I think, much much better. Okay, here we go. Find the intervals where uh, f is increasing and decreasing, and then, of course, use that to find the extrema. Typical calculus question, not hard. Let's do it, and we're not going to use a calculator. Here we go. The derivative, you'd have 2 thirds x to the negative 1 third, right, which would be uh, 2 over 3x to the 1 third. So we would want to find where this derivative is equal to 0 or where that derivative is undefined. Now here, you're not going to have any issues with that derivative being 0. The top is never going to be equal to 0. But I will have an issue with that derivative being undefined. Clearly, if x is 0, that's going to make your derivative divide by 0, so that would make your derivative undefined. So we do have a critical point. That critical point is going to happen when x equals 0. Uh, that's where my derivative is undefined. Now, let's check. f of 0, does that point exist? You have 0 to the 2 thirds power. 0 squared is 0. The cube root of 0 is 0. Yes, so you do have a point. The function is defined, so that's good. It's not an asymptote or anything weird so that the function doesn't exist. There is a point there. It's just going to have a cusp, so the slope isn't going to exist there. But let's take that critical point, and then let's do a sign chart. Remember, your derivative here was undefined. Let's do a sign chart now for it. If I picked a number to the right of 0, like 1, or if you don't like 1, you could use 42, or you could use 9,000. It doesn't matter. Right? Any, any number bigger than 0 will work. But I want to pick a test point that represents that interval. I'm going to plug it into the derivative to see whether it yields a positive result or a negative result. Let's go for it. The top is 2, and, and 2 is positive. hate to break it to you. 2 is positive, right? It's just always going to be. 2 is also going to be positive for the other interval. But let's see, if I plugged in something like 1, let's see, the, the cube root of 1 would be 1, 3 times 1. Okay, so you'd get a positive value in the denominator as well. And if you get a positive on the top and a positive on the bottom, then overall, I know that result would be positive. So I know f would be increasing. The first derivative being positive means your original function is increasing. Great, let's do the other interval. If I picked something like negative 1, the cube root of negative 1 would be negative 1. And then 3 times negative 1 would be negative 3. You don't care about the 3. All you need to know is that, hey, that denominator is going to be negative, which means overall that derivative is going to produce out a, negative, uh, is going to produce out 
sorry, I can't speak, a negative value. And if your first derivative is negative, that means your original function will be decreasing. And here, look at the shape. If your function changes from going down to going up, we know that point is going to have to be a minimum. There's no way it could be a max. If you change from decreasing to increasing, that specific turning point must be a minimum. So we've got this sign chart. Now the sign chart is not the answer, but it's everything we need for the answers. Uh, so let's go ahead and wrap this question up. We see f is increasing for uh, zero to infinity because the derivative is positive, right? That's this interval. f is decreasing for negative infinity to zero because your derivative is negative, All right? So we've got the increasing, we've got the decreasing, and then we can say, hey, zero, zero is a relative minimum. And then you could say, because your derivative changes from negative to positive. Or you could say your original function changes from decreasing to increasing. All right, so a lot of stuff here for this answer, sorry, I kind of got really ugly and unorganized. That's okay. We'll live. Uh, we, we got the max and the mins. There was only the min. There was no max for this one. If you were to look at the graph, I believe it's going to end up looking something sort of like this, kind of like a weird look looking bat. Uh, it does have a cusp uh, right at the origin, but it is decreasing on the left, increasing on the right, and so that point is going to end up being a min. Slope is undefined, but that's okay. You can still have a max or min at that spot where the slope is undefined. I'm going to pause it just really quick so that I can uh, actually take a phone call, and then I'm going to get back with the next example. Okay, I'm back. Let's do the last two examples, then we'll stop, and we'll do the second derivative in the next, exa uh, in the next video. All right, 6.9, here we go. Gives me some function, it says it's the revenue and thousands of dollars, great. What's the maximum revenue? Okay, so it wants me to maximize this, this revenue. So I'm gonna figure out, hey, what's the maximum? And maximum means the derivative has to be zero. Uh, and if the derivative is gonna be zero, take the derivative and set it equal to zero. So here we go, derivative. Uh, oh, shoot. That's really ugly. I'm actually going to, before I take the derivative, I'm just going to change it all to fractions just because I think that's nicer. It'd be negative 1 over 20x squared plus 10x minus 350. Okay, now taking a derivative should be a little bit nicer. Let's see. If I were to take the derivative, that 2 is going to multiply it down to the front, so I'm going to have a negative 1 tenth x plus 10. Then I would set that derivative equal to 0. Solve it, so set this equal to zero, and then add that over. 10 is going to equal 1 tenth x, so it looks like 100 is going to equal x. Okay, so 100 is the x value that's going to generate the max. If you wanted to check it, you could. All right, so let's see, here's your x value of 100. That makes the derivative zero. Uh, now let's see, if I plugged in a number bigger than 100, uh, like, like how about... 200. Uh, if I were to plug something in, uh, 200 times negative 1 tenth, so that'd be like negative 20 plus 10. Okay, so your derivative would be negative over here, which means decreasing. And then if you were to plug in something like 50, uh, 50 times negative 1 tenth would be negative 5. Negative 5 plus 10 would be positive. So look, we did confirm that we're going to end up having a maximum right there when x is uh, 100. So that's good. And then it doesn't just ask, hey, like, what's the x value? Like, I mean, it does. It says, uh, what's, how many units are they going to have to sell? Well, 100 units, that's the x value. But then it asks, what is that maximum revenue? So now we'd have to plug that x value in to the original function and then figure out what that revenue is. Just pretend you have your calculator, type it all in. You're going to end up getting 150. Okay, now don't forget, the units are in thousands of dollars. So you must sell... 100 units to maximize, oops, the revenue, max revenue is 150,000. Okay, sorry, I kind of ran out of room, that's okay. So the max revenue is the value that you would get uh, when you plug in the 100 to your original function. Don't forget your units are in thousands of dollars. 
Okay, now we have this last example where it says we have a cost given by the C of X, uh, and now it's wanting us to not only maximize the revenue, revenue is how much money you bring in, cost is how much money you send out, and then the profit obviously is going to be the revenue minus the cost, right? So just some little terminology, the profit is gonna be the revenue minus the cost. So if I want to maximize the profit, I'm gonna to have to figure out the profit equation, then take the derivative and set it equal to zero. Okay, so let us go for it. Here we go, the revenue was the negative one, uh, Sure, we'll just, I, I have this one in decimals now, so we'll just go back to the decimals. Negative 0.05x squared plus 10x minus 350 minus, then it gave us the cost. Don't forget to distribute the negative, then combine your like terms. It looks like for this profit function, we're going to get negative 0.05x squared. 10 minus 0.8 uh, is looking like a 9.2x, then three, negative 350 minus 20, so it looks like a negative 370. Okay, so there's your profit equation. How we got that was the revenue minus the cost, and then we need to take this derivative and set it equal to zero. Okay, so here's your negative one-tenth again, plus 9.2 set that derivative equal to zero, solve it. It looks like here we're going to end up figuring out 92 units. That's what's going to end up hopefully maximizing. Let's check it. P prime. Let's pick a number bigger than 92, like 95 or 93 or 142. It doesn't matter. Uh, if you pick any number bigger than 92 and plug that in for x, uh, you're going to end up getting a negative result which means decreasing. If you pick a number like five or, or like 25 or any number smaller than 92, uh, when you plug it in here, you're gonna end up getting a positive result, so increasing. So we can confirm that it's a max by just doing the little sign chart, and that's wonderful. Uh, and then let's answer this. Must sell 92 units to maximize the profit, and then the max profit is, uh, and now I'd have to take 92 and plug it back in to the profit uh, equation. If you take 92 and you plug it in here, uh, you're going to end up getting 53.2. So it'd be $53,000. $200. Sorry, I'm lazy. I want this video to end because I'm busy. Uh, just pretend like I, I showed you on the calculator. I, I, I firmly believe all of you guys could type that into your calculator and then could plug in 92. I'm just skipping this step. Okay, so uh, let's again kind of recap your first derivative test. That's the important stuff uh, today. We use the first derivative to figure out where the function is increasing and decreasing. And then specifically where that function changes from increasing to decreasing or from decreasing to increasing, we can use that sign chart to identify relative extrema. Like let's say if I have something like A, B, C, D, E, we'll say F and G. How about this? So we have all these critical points. We'll say some of them are zeros. Some of them could be undefined. It doesn't matter. Critical points, that's the collection of all of the things that make the derivative either zero or undefined. So you'd collect all of those critical points and you would put them on the sign chart. And then you'd have to test, right? And let's say we test uh, this one. Let's say we get positive, negative, positive, negative, negative, positive, positive, negative. Let's say we do a sign chart and it just happens to come out like this, okay? Well, we could figure out pretty much everything we want to know about the original function. We know, hey, if the derivative is positive, f is increasing. Then it would be decreasing. Then increasing, decreasing, decreasing, increasing, increasing, decreasing. So this would be like a lot harder than any example we would actually see. But let's see if I had a sign chart that happened to break down like this. Would we have a min, a max, or neither at each one of those critical points? Let's look at A. Uh, the derivative changed from positive to negative, so that means F changed from increasing to decreasing. That means you'd have a relative maximum. That's easy. 
Let's look at the critical point B. If the derivative changes negative to positive, that means you had negative slopes, changed to positive slopes, and if F changes from decreasing to increasing, you know that's going to be a min. C is going to be a max, just like A. But look at D. If it was decreasing, and then it's constant, and then it's decreasing again, well, that would be neither a max nor a minimum. Okay, E looks like a minimum. F, if it's increasing, constant, and then increasing, that's going to be another neither. And then here at G, you have a max. So this whole idea about sign charts is that you can test that first derivative, you figure out all your critical points, anything that makes the derivative zero or undefined, you throw those values on the sign chart that takes your number line and it splits it into little subintervals. And then you test each subinterval for positivity. You see whether that subinterval is going to generate positive results or negative results. And then the derivative being positive or negative is going to correspondingly tell you what the slope of the original function is. Positive means increasing, negative means decreasing. And then you just look how that function changes slope or how it changes behavior affects whether that function is going to have a relative max, a relative min, or maybe neither at all of those respective critical points, right? So that's important. That's your first derivative test. That's your uh, doing all this stuff with the first derivative sign chart. Uh, the next video we're going to pick up in the same notes packet, but then we're going to be talking about the second derivative and what that tells us uh, about the graph.